1961, President Dwight Eisenhower, he um, surprised the U.S. public and he mentioned, was a new term at the time, the military-industrial complex. In the councils of government, we must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. It was a warning that he was seeing something, this relationship between private industry, between government, between the military, that could get out of control. When he made the farewell speech in 1961, if you looked in the, in the, in the U.S.-Mexico borderlands, there was basically a chain link fence that separated the two countries, if that. The United States is bordered by two friendly nations. There are no fortifications on our land borders. These children will visit their grandmother in San Diego. This idea of a hardened international boundary that needs to have agents and, and all kinds of technology stopping people, stopping the movements of people, is actually a very, very new phenomenon. In the 1990s, we start seeing this aggressive new version of border militarization. And oddly enough, it was not introduced by a Republican, but by a Democratic administration, Bill Clinton's. And it was led not by some angry white guy, but by a Latino. The sector chief of El Paso, sector chief, a man by the name of Silvestre Reyes, he said, okay, we're going to change our strategy and we're going to put the border patrol agents right on the line. Each agent would have a station, one after the other, after the other, after the other. I believe there was about 100 feet or 200 feet apart. It's the 20th anniversary of when the face of our border dramatically changed. Operation Hold the Line was enacted 20 years ago. With Silvestre Reyes and Operation Hold the Line and other operations, you have de facto militarization of the border through troops, through more heavy weaponry, through aircraft through ideas about immigrants that are now seeing the immigrant as the enemy and not just as an immigrant worker. And this whole idea of this hardened border that needs to be patrolled, that you need to have your agents sitting their X's, that you need to concentrate technology, that you need to have walls, that you need to have sensors, that you need to stop people, that you need to detain people, that you need to put them, incarcerate them if they do cross. The idea that crossing a line is criminal was, was put into place in the 1990s, and maybe even now in the post-9-11 era, an act of war, so to speak, makes a border not, even, not only a hardened line to be enforced, but also a front line in, in, in a potential, or at least a, as, as, as it's framed in the to, the to the national imagination, the idea it's a front line to some sort of war or a war on terror. The terrorists are crossing the southwest border from Mexico. Illegals caught crossing are from Mexico or South America. Mandates that the federal government ensure and guarantee that the states are protected against, quote, invasion. And then after 2001 and 9-11, you have the creation of Homeland Security. And immigration is at the center, in many ways, of the creation of Homeland Security, the fear of migrants, the militarization of immigration policies. I would say that after 9-11, there was real concern about terrorists coming into the United States. And so there was an enormous investment of resources in uh, the border region. If you look at the last, especially in the post 9-11 years, the ranks of Border Patrol has gone from, has doubled. It was, it was 10,000, approximately 10,000 agents at the time of September 11, 2001. And now it's 21,000 agents. How much are American families going to spend to make all the politicians happy on this. In fiscal year 2012, the, the border and immigration enforcement budgets were at $18 billion for that year. And that number, $18 billion, is more than all other federal law enforcement agencies combined. It's more than the DEA, the FBI, um, all the different federal agencies combined. So what's the result? Are we catching terrorists at the border? No, um, is, is the answer to that question. Uh, are we stopping drugs from coming into the United States? It, has drug consumption greatly decreased in the United States because of this effort? That would be, the answer to that would be no. As the United States declines economically, the border rises. 
the drones get more sophisticated. The National Guard becomes more present by the thousands. That has nothing to do with immigrants and everything to do with security of elite interests that are losing control of the economy and of the political system. Our border with Mexico is the target of a push by members of Congress who want a dramatic increase in agents, technology, and fencing. The price tag for securing the border? Roughly $30 billion. This is about securing the border first. 10 of the top 13 cities at the border have been certified safe by the FBI and other law enforcement agencies. So the border is safe. Apprehensions uh, are now at the lowest level they've been since the 1970s. I mean, this is a, we've spent a lot of money on this already, and we are not at a point in which spending a lot more money is going to bring a, a different result. So when you read the 800, 1200 pages of comprehensive immigration reform in 2004 and 2013, they all have one thing in common. It's a big focus on border security, which is code for border militarization. The idea of the bring the battlefield to the border is very present. Companies from the United States that were profiteering in Afghanistan and Iraq are now profiteering off of immigration policies. They, they want a contract to build the wall. They want a contract to build the cameras. They want a contract to build the surveillance systems. Welcome to the Border Security Expo in downtown Phoenix, where Border Patrol meets big business. This is where 175 companies from across the globe show off their latest weapons, cameras, and toys, and everything in between. The international market for border security in 2011 was estimated to be about 19 or 20 billion dollars. My guess is it's probably doubled in the last two or three years. The largest market for Homeland Security, border security technology is the U.S. government, the Department of Homeland Security, Department of Defense, Department of Energy, and others. We are attracting companies that want to come here and have their product tested by a third party, in this case the university, uh, demonstrate the efficacy, the effectiveness of that technology and present it to the marketplace. The Secure Fence Act of 2006 built 700 miles of fencing um, along the U.S.-Mexico border and not many know what the price tag, but it's, it's astronomical. It's about three to seven million dollars per mile. For example, K KBR, um, which is a Halliburton subsidiary, had got a contract two years ago, over $30 million, to maintain the border fence, whatever that means. <laughs> so you can guess, what does that mean? What is to maintain and why $30 million? The current uh, approach to the Integrated Fixed Tower Program, or IFT, is to use off-the-shelf technology that then can solve this problem of border security and detection. The Integrated Fixed Tower Project in its first phase is a three to four hundred million dollar deployment. So this is a very significant contract that's being awarded and it will have significant economic benefit to whoever wins it and wherever they place their base of operation. We're hoping the winner will actually come to the tech park and put their base of operation here. If we're discussing anything like immigration reform, we have to we have to include the fact that there are there is a profit motive and a profit making actor in the sphere, in the sphere of influence, and probably exerting significant influence upon our policymakers. General Atomics, a company located down in San Diego, uh, manufactures the Predator B drones. And these are drones that have been flying in the military since 1995. And General Atomics is a very large defense contractor and has quite a lot of influence in Congress. Uh, they're a member of the drone lobby uh, called the AUVSI and that group has quite a lot of power in Congress and pushed Congress to pass a, a law called the FAA Modernization Act in 2012 that pushed the FAA to open up the skies to more drones by 2015. So when you look at border policy and they talk about drones, just don't think it's something really far from you. Drones are coming your way through immigration policy. Customs and Border Protection says that it does not equip the drones with weapons. However, we've seen a recent report that showed that Customs and Border Protection has considered this um, for future drones. They're telling us that a board, militarized border protects freedom. What freedom are they protecting? It's not my freedom. 
They're protecting the freedom of corporations to continue to profit. Homeland Security is is building a fortress around our country and making people afraid. It's telling people that there are enemies out to get them and they should be afraid of them. And, and the people that are deemed enemies are being abused left and right. So whatever way you look at it, it's, it's becoming a less safe country in almost every single facet. When we talk about border militarization, it's not just the physical, like drones, the physical small tanks. It's also the idea of militarization, the ideology of militarization, not just of the border, but of the country itself. Eisenhower's warning, or his the, the, the nightmare scenario of his warning came true. There's no way that Eisenhower could even fathom the walls, the cameras, the technologies, the, the expensive, expensive equipment um, that's been put on our borders at taxpayers' expenses. There is a recurring temptation to feel that some spectacular and costly action could become the miraculous solution to all current difficulties. The detention of migrants is a multi-billion dollar industry. One in which immigrants are traded like products. They are for sale to the highest bidder. Who benefits and who profits? 